Brandon Monroe, how are you, sir? Matt, I couldn't be better because I'm in Namibia. Namibia? What are you doing there? Well, we've had a mining expo here. So the Namibian Chamber of Mines has an annual mining expo. It's the 10th time they've run it. And it's actually been really good, like really good. You wander around, it finished yesterday, you wander around and have to remind yourself that Namibia is a country with only two and a half million people. And yet it's able to put on a really um, a mature, vibrant and uh, large mining expo. So it's grown about 60% from last year. And a lot of that, of course, has benefited from all of the action that's going on in the oil and gas sector as well. So a good couple of days. And uh, for me, it's a very good, let's call it networking, but really we mean partying opportunity because I've got so many friends in this sector after living in the country for five or six years. So it's always fun returning and catching up with people that I haven't seen in a while and and uh, getting a really good sense of the pulse of the Namibian mining industry. I, I, I've seen you dancing in country. It's something to behold indeed. But we, look, we, better, we better stick to business though. So obviously um, you're, you're there representing your company um, and obviously catching up with the team um, as well. So let me talk us through what you actually do when, when you kind of come into country and um, you know, you're, you're meeting up with the team and obviously going to site. What are the sorts of things that you cover off? Yeah, I came in on Sunday night and so we had a day of meeting with the team. So the team came up to Vintook, which is where I am, and uh, some of our directors who are here in Vintook. And we had our Chief Operating Officer, Gavin Chamberlain, who you've met, fly up from Cape Town. Olga Skolyakova came down from London. So it was a chance for us all to get together and spend a good solid day and a half working through things as an ex-co. The Chamber of Mines had a council meeting on Tuesday and normally I dial in for those. So it was really nice to be there in person. And then the mining expo started on Wednesday and Thursday and all of the usual accoutrements to these events with uh, dinners and uh, lots of discussions about everything that's going on, a couple of meetings at the ministry. So the things that you would normally expect of us and the, the pleasure about the Namibian mining sector is it's it's small. It, you could almost call it an intimate mining sector, despite the fact that there were um, over 150 exhibitors at this mining expo. So it's easy to get a meeting at Mines and Energy. It's easy to reach my peers who are CEOs of various companies. And it's a very condensed format that just presents tremendous return on effort. Well, tell me, tell me a little bit about that because I, I, I guess where I want to go, I've seen, I've seen a bit of M and A activity in the marketplace, and you know a few spin outs and a few joint ventures, and I, and, and I want to get it, get into that in a second. But just sticking with you and Namibia for us, if you don't mind, is you guys have got a, as a, an advanced development story, you know, waiting to kind of move to sort of an FID um, in a, can this this obviously resurgent um, uranium nuclear sector that we, we we talk about most weeks is how do you time the market? Because you've got to time the market in terms of um, that FID element. You've got to try and time the market in terms of the ability to do business in country with the relevant permits, licenses, um, permissions, hiring of staff and, and, and so forth, and getting equipment in and all of all those wonderful things. You, they, you've got to marry those things up. So you. There's a sort of d delicate little dance that, that you, you, you play. W where are you in that at the moment with, with your own company? Well, it is quite a delicate dance. So it's a nice way of putting it because it is a complex calculus that we've been working on for since at least this time last year. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment from a shareholder or investor's perspective. But to answer the question where we're at, so we completed the definitive feasibility study in December last year. That was with the 8 million tonne per annum development of our Atango project with the capacity to then expand that once we're in production and profitable up to potentially 20 million tonnes. We made the decision at that point to continue with our front end engineering and design work using our equity cash balance. 
since then we've uh, spent about 45 million rand, uh, 45 million Namibian dollars, uh, which um, equates in Australian dollars to about $4 million. And that's been on the feed program. And that's been the first important part of this delicate dance. We wanted to make sure that we continue the engineering moving forward towards the development decision as we anticipated that the market would do basically what it's been doing this in the last week and what we can look forward to over the next few months. Now, the reason is that you don't want to complete a DFS and then wait for debt funding to do the feed, which is still the conventional way of thinking about these um, development processes. We wanted to give ourselves maximum flexibility to engage with financing the project at exactly the right time. So we had the cash balance to continue with the front-end engineering and design. That kept all of the design current. That's really important that the pricing is current in this very dynamic market. If you're not doing that, a DFS, even if it's only six months old, can become out of date and can invite skepticism from investors and financiers and other stakeholders. Uh, and of course, what it does is by doing this front-end engineering and design, it keeps us moving closer towards that ultimate production date. And it means that we're not waiting to do to complete a financing and use the debt drawdown to start what could be at least a nine-month process. So we're, uh, we started that in uh, basically as soon as our DFS was completed and we've completed the first phase of that front-end engineering and design. Now, the next important thing for a investor or shareholder to want to know is that we've got a very strong handle and a strong understanding on exactly what the long lead items are. So for our project, the most important long lead item is construction of our temporary water pipeline. So we can't start making concrete until we've got water to site. And uh, for us, what that means is we'll need our mining license um, to be able to start that construction. And then we'll build a pipeline from the Rossing pipeline to the north of our project. That pipeline will go directly south and um, through, you might remember you're at the Goana Conti's um, restaurant. It'll come out there, provide some water to the local people there, which I'm sure they'll be pleased about and then it'll just go up that ravine to our main project. Now, we don't need to do that yet, uh, but that will be an early focus once we once our mining license is granted. Um, there are some other long lead items that will also commence once the mining license is granted, for example, an access road. Um, so from a project point of view, a lot of the delicate dance is ensuring that we've got we continue moving forward, advancing the project, but we don't let any of our numbers go stale. And, uh, you know, we can talk at some length about what the approach has been led by Gavin Chamberlain, who's an extremely experienced project builder, and some of the tricks of the trade that he's used to make sure that we can have our cake and eat it in terms of obtaining detailed vendor drawings, for example, um, without... Um, having tender fatigue from the various vendors. Uh, from a market point of view, timing the market correctly requires the ability to be patient and to wait. It requires the ability to avoid painting yourself into any corners, particularly with the stock exchange and investors. And I think people who followed us would understand that we're not um, making ourselves beholden to any particular time frames or commitments, we'll do it when we think the timing is right. And uh, we haven't yet written any long-term contracts. And when you track the way that the uranium price has moved, even in the last week, that's obviously borne out the value of that strategy. Uh, and then the final thing is uh, permitting. Now, we're in the very fortunate position that we have all of our environmental permits from the main in, uh, permit required to construct the project. And, and operate the mine right through to the secondary permits required, for example, for the temporary water pipeline that I talked about. So that's all taken care of. And the one remaining um, item that we need there is the mining license. And that's something that we've obviously been talking to government about and, and getting a clearer picture on this week. And um, that enables us to move forward with the temporary water pipeline. 
And that's really the main urgency at this point from an investor's point of view. And um, we will watch and wait as we see the long-term contracting market develop over the next few months. And we'll be making a decision as to um, what point we're able to um, enter that market and what levels of confidence that we'll need to see from a market point of view on that front. Okay, look, and I, I do appreciate obviously having a large cash balance um, gives you optionality in terms of how you time it. You don't need to rush it or, or as you say, um, with regards to let let, pr- let the pricing go stale, um, you know, and, 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 I, and I, I get all of that. The, the, the one thing you said in there was you, there, there's lots of good things in there that investors should be listening to and going and applying that to their own investments wherever else, that whatever else they've got in their portfolio in terms of development place. But the one thing they're going to be laser focused on is the license issue. So you, you, you've had some conversations and you sort of, this week you say, to sort of understand, you know, make sure you're on top of the kind of the process and what is required of you and make sure nothing's changed. But timing of that, how long does it take in Namibia to go through that process? It, are there any obvious barriers, hurdles, red flags that we should be looking for? The timing can be variable, and and if there's the Namibia has a really good market, and that's one of the real advantages of dealing in country. Um, the disadvantage of the mining code is it doesn't have fixed time frames, so we can't say after thirty days they must deliver this, or after ninety days we expect this, and um, so that does leave it quite open. The uh, I can't think of too many mining licenses that have been granted to um, genuine foreign investors in under 12 months. Um, the, all of the high um, profile mining license that have been granted in the last few years have been around that time frame. What we've learned while we've been in countries, first of all, we haven't identified any red flags at all with our application. It's, you know, it's widely accepted um, by everyone we've spoken to in the ministry as being highly comprehensive and, you know, we're a project of national importance here, so we're very well understood. What we did discover is that the ministry is getting absolutely inundated with new exploration license applications. And so on the one hand, that's a good litmus test as to the health of the industry and the way that Namibia is regarded by foreign investors. But the minister acknowledged in in a forum during the mining expo that they're receiving in a, in a slow week more than 50 EPL applications. So the system is becoming absolutely overwhelmed. Um, there's a high level of probity and scrutiny into all of those applications. And so that means the re- human resources required to process 50 EPLs that are incoming every single week um, let alone deal with the backlog, is really quite significant. So that's that's where we're at at the moment. Um, the the ministry understands, particularly now after I've been in country, as to where the mining license fits in in terms of those other factors. And uh, from our perspective, as I say, the the main thing that we want to start with is the the long lead items. Um, they're not at the point yet where they will become a um, a critical factor, but we don't want them to become the bottleneck, and so that's that's what we're making sure the ministry understands. Okay, the, the other thing I want to talk to you about is um, Namibia twinned with Saudi Arabia in in the sense that you know the Saudis are recognising that oil is you know um, a finite resource, and they're getting into hydrogen energy. They're actually searching for uranium, gold, and and, and lots of other things. Namibia recently announcing that um, you've got a couple of big companies, one of them being BHP, um, discovering oil offshore. Plus, you've got your hydrogen uh, uh, sector as well going on in there. So, is it, it w- what's happening in country with terms of again, maybe back to the ministry conversations, positioning itself as a sort of energy center for Southern Africa? It's quite extraordinary. Like Namibia, obviously, is already on the world stage when it comes to uranium. But uranium is still a small commodity compared to oil and gas, for example, and hydrocarbons. So it's true that after 30 years of post-independence exploration, 
21 failed <laughs> drill holes, more than 100 billion rand of expiration dollars spent in the petroleum sector. After all of that, roughly a year ago, a successful well was drilled and another two have been drilled since. So this is um, predominantly conducted by Total, uh, Qatar and Shell. So the majors have finally come good after, a let's say, a significant period of scepticism about whether the oil is even there. Now that's had a transformative effect on, let's say, the national psyche and handled correctly has some uh, has a very real potential to have a transformative effect on the country. To give you an idea, it's very realistic to think that uh, within a couple of years of the first of those wells coming on, Namibia's GDP will double. Double. You know, that is extraordinary. And, and remember what I said before, it's only two and a half million people here. So there's the potential for it to um, have a profound effect as long as it's handled correctly. And one thing that I can say is I've got a lot of confidence in the current Minister of Mines, Honourable Tom Alwindo. He understands that and he also understands very well the resource curse that can happen with oil. Um, Minister Alwindo uh, is an economist. Uh, I know him well. He's exceptionally clever. He was the governor of the Reserve Bank of Namibia for a decade. He was then in charge of, he was the Director General of Planning. So. Uh, he was responsible for having a bird's eye view of the entire economy. And now he holds the most important portfolio in the ministry, which oversees both the mining sector, which is very important in today's terms, and the oil and gas sector, which, as I said, can be utterly transformative. And also green hydrogen um, touches on that energy portfolio as well. So whilst green hydrogen doesn't have quite the same uh, certainty that an oil and gas pathway does. It does hold a lot of potential in Namibia. And I think one of the reasons why I'm inclined to be a believer rather than a skeptic is the main sponsor currently of Namibia's green hydrogen program is Germany. And we know well from the nuclear power sector that um, Germany's prepared to uh, back their renewables program and all of the potential backstops that are required to support that program to the hilt. Now, you add in a little bit of complex German history in Namibia, in the, including the fact that they were a, a former German colony, that um, Germany has admitted to conducting genocides at the beginning of the 20th century here. And you've got a really, really um, strong link between Germany's need to come up with interesting energy solutions, given they can't use nuclear power, and their interest in assisting Namibia to develop. Now, if you apply an optimistic view of what the green hydrogen industry could deliver here, uh, it's got the potential to double the GDP again. So oil and gas, I think you the timing is still open a little bit, but uh, there's enough confidence that the discoveries are there, they're viable, they're large. And so you can have a high degree of confidence that that's going to have this big impact on Namibia's GDP. Green hydrogen, you know, it'll take a little bit of time to understand what's reality and what's hype. Uh, but there's a good prospect, I think, that it is going to be a significant contributor to GDP as well. So you imagine having all that in the background, and that's why we've had this enormously vibrant mining expo uh, that's taken place and Namibia is now positioned to be a significant player in the current most important energy source in the world, which of course is still oil and gas, the future most important energy source in the world, which is nuclear power, and then a complementary energy source uh, to both of those, uh, which is green hydrogen and hydrogen generally. It's like, it's like exciting times in, in Namibia for, sh for sure. Obviously, so we're, we're, given what we're seeing you know, in uh, the West, uh, West Africa, the, the whole Sahel region is you know, it's uncertain times up there and hopefully there's some resolutions to that um, in one way or, or another soon. Um, but y y you're right. This, this kind of the oil component, If it's a nice problem to have if you know how to handle it and you learn lessons from history and elsewhere 
you know, otherwise that 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 saying of the the curse the curse of oil or the paradox of plenty um, will will I guess hold hold the country. Um, we better move on because I that that was a way to. I really enjoyed that because I, I've learned a lot in there. I think there's a lot to take away. There's a lot to explore and, and dig into. Um, so we better better scoot on with the rest of the agenda, if you don't mind. I think we can come back to that one because that I think that's going to run and run. Um, and, and nice to see, um, you know, Namibia actually um, having the opportunity to deal with some of these op- the, 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 these things that are happening. Okay, we better talk uh, about winner of the week. Who are you allocating that to this week? Well, I think we can award it to the sector generally, and uh, if if we can give the winner, yay! A... Well done, us. <laughs> well, well, I finally, I finally, I'm a winner, right? Well, I think everyone it... who's been on the buy side, let's put it that way. So the spot price has moved in two significant leaps. On Wednesday, it jumped a dollar forty to um, hit fifty nine ninety. I'm using trade tech numbers now, and then. It jumped another dollar forty-five overnight here. So the spot price has now pushed well through sixty dollars, and it wasn't that long ago that it had formed a nice little base at about fifty. I remember us saying in this show this calendar year that uh, we really didn't think that it would fall below fifty, and it had lots of upside to show. So for any of the um, clever traders who accumulated uranium in the fifties when the world was panicking about Silicon Valley bank collapse and so on. Good on them. They've already made 20% in a highly asymmetrical trade. Uh, for anyone who bought Sput back in those days and slowly accumulated, they've already done well. And of course, we're starting to see the beginning of an equities response. And I, my personal perspective is that there's still a lot of value yet to yield in most quality uranium stocks. Uh, there's still many um, good quality stocks that still uh, significantly discounted to their highs in 2021, uh, the last time that Sput really started to move. And what's extraordinary is other than Sput issuing its first units over the last couple of days, it hasn't played a role in this latest uh, appreciation of the spot price whatsoever. So the spot price has moved from $50 all the way up to $61 without a single pound being bought by Sput. And that will weigh heavily on the utilities because they now need to confront the fact that, well, actually, the current spot price is the real market price. It's not a price that's been bought up by an artificial buyer, which is how they regard Sput. Those Sput pounds are now sequestered away. Uh, they... Uh, That is the mobile inventory that had held the sector back for so long. So even if uh, in the very unlikely scenario that we don't see significant spot price buying, a spot market buying by Sput, they've still played an enormous role in achieving their early objectives, which to be fair to Sput included transparency in the market and reducing the opacity of the market. And by removing those market overhangs in the form of mobile inventory, they've contributed significantly to that objective. Now, another interesting way of looking and uh, awarding the winner of the week to the market generally is seeing flows of funds back into ETFs. Now, that was a reversal after Silicon Valley Bank. We saw the flows out and that had a big effect on many equities, including Bannerman Energy. Uh, We felt acutely the effect of uh, the ETF redemptions because Bannerman is in all four of the major ETFs and then their various listings on other exchanges that they have. Now that's starting to reverse the other way. So we're, uh, we're seeing clearly in our trading patterns and our volumes the impact that these, these investments into these ETFs and the flow through buying that they need to do in a non-discretionary way are having on our price. We think that this is only just the beginning. There'll be a lot of activity start from next week. World Nuclear Association Symposium kicks off on Wednesday. The spot price will be a key talking point, which is always a very nice way to frame up those discussions. And that kickstarts what's traditionally been the season of utility and trader activity. And if history can tell us anything to learn by, that will be activity compounded by financial buyer activity, whether it's through sput whether it's through Yellowcake, 
whether it's through some of the new entrances like ANU Energy out of Kazakhstan. Of course, we've uh, got the AMC, uh, Zuri Invest AMC certificates coming out of Zuri, which may also start contributing and um, competing on the spot market. And then the final important player in all of this are the producers themselves. So find me another industry that has all of those dynamics and the producers competing against themselves in the spot market. So that's a, a really interesting dynamic. Um, it, we'll put on this uh, screen a chart from Grant Chalmers, a previous Tweet of the Week winner. So we'll just get that up and I'm starting to follow very, very closely as an investment signal the flow of funds. So if we look at this chart um, that, uh, that we've got on the screen now, you can see between mid-2021 a huge uh, shift up in the flow of funds into these ETFs. Now, it's a, it's an, um, you need to bear in mind that it's a logarithmic scale here. So you need to pay more attention to the upper chart than the lower chart. Um, but any movement on that upper chart is very significant. So that movement um, from August 2021 saw share prices double and triple in a couple of months. We are seeing the trend, it's not as abrupt, but we're seeing a trend just in the last couple of months upwards of that is likely to continue to a similar level. So that seven day rolling average is something that keep your eyes glued on, I think, to um, Grant Chalmers' Twitter feed, um, because as we start to see uh, significant movements in that, I think that's a key trigger point for equities as well. Now, as a well-trained uranium investor, you kind of want to be ahead of those movements, of course. The point is, though, that the wall of money that will fundamentally move values in this sector, equities values, are generalist investors. They're not the people who've been watching the energy show for the last three years. It's the people who are just starting to discover uranium. Maybe they've read about the coup in Niger and it's piqued their interest. And, and from that, they've read about the enormous sector deficits that are being run. And they've, then they've read about Sput and how it's tightened up the market. Then when they start to see the flow of money, that's almost the last box to be ticked. A generalist investor wants to know that they are in front of money that's pushing from behind. They want to know that the tailwinds are there. And money flows are one of the singular most important metrics that generalist investors will follow into a relatively small sector like uranium. So he's positioned enormously well. I, I mentioned, uh, I think it was the um, last show that we were on, that I was feeling pretty buoyant about the sector. And we're starting now to see the very first of many indications that that excitement wasn't misfounded. It's, it's, it's good. It's, it's priming, it's being primed. Um, I wonder how long before we kind of get the $200 uranium crowd um, shouting and screaming again, because screaming again. Uh, I think this, this is everything that they want to see um, and, uh, and have hoped for the last two years. It's finally starting to move. Um, better talk about Bungle of the Week. Who we're looking at there? <laughs> Some friends of ours, I think. Let me just say, it gives me great pleasure to award the bungle of the week this week to Friends of the Earth. So they trotted out their old tired playbook of lawfare, and they got it handed back to them. I'm pleased to say. So they they tried to stop the restart of the Diablo Canyon reactors in California. Uh, this is the end of the road in a very long campaign that they've waged against this nuclear power plant, uh, initially successfully, and then uh, because of the sheer pressures of what they ought to be focusing on, of course, which is the planet and climate change pressures, uh, sense has prevailed. The court has thrown it out. They've said, we've seen enough of you guys. Um, the plant will open. And I think it's a little bit sweet as well because Friends of the Earth were one of the original architects of the lawfare campaigns that made nuclear power much more expensive, slower to deliver, uh, it's harder to permit, 
and the collective um, inertia that we have around the world in our tools to be able to deal with climate change is significantly exacerbated by the lack of nuclear power that that is in the world right now. It's still only around 10% of the world's electricity and a small proportion of the world's energy. And people like Friends of the Earth and their dear cousins at Greenpeace have uh, tied one hand behind the world's back in being able to deal with climate change by deliberately and intentionally sabotaging what we now know beyond any doubt scientifically is the safest, one of the cheapest, the most reliable and the cleanest on a life cycle basis form of energy that humanity's ever developed. So hence the pleasure in awarding the bungle of the week. May I wish friends of the earth many future bungles. Well, 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 well done that. Well done. They've won, they've, they've won something at last. Good. Um, so not complete failure. They, they've won bungle of the week. They just didn't win the case. Um, Right, and without being too facetious, um, let, actually, let you mentioned them. You gave them a name drop, so let's skip to skip to this bit, which is um, tweet of the week for, for the other half of of that um, motley crew. Uh, he he allocating the tweet of the week to. So this is before we put it on the screen. I just want to frame this up. This is an extraordinary bellwether or litmus test of how much unseen support there is for nuclear power and also how much recognition there is for the you know the the damaging tactics that i was just talking about before so somebody that i'd never heard of and i'm i'm about to mangle her name and i'm apologizing in advance but i'm going to say ia anstut the reason i'd never heard about her is in her very first tweet now get this her very first tweet she managed to achieve almost a million uh, views and, uh, sorry, almost, uh, yeah, a million views, over 3,000 likes and over 1,000 reposts. So let's put it up here. And what we can see here is today I'm launching the campaign, Dear Greenpeace, hashtag green, Dear Greenpeace, with Let's Free Planet, which asks Greenpeace to drop their opposition to nuclear energy and support young people in securing their future. Simple, but there's a campaign behind it. And it shows the depth of that sentiment. If an unknown Twitter account from uh, an activist that probably most of us have never heard from or of can achieve that level of penetration with their maiden tweet, there are a lot of people out there who feel just as angry as I do about the climate vandalism that Greenpeace has been able to get away with in their opposition to nuclear power. And maybe they were justified in having some of those views 50 years ago, but they cannot deny the science. They cannot deny the statistics. And everything that they do in their marketing machine now is blatant, dishonest, and reprehensible. And so in her rather kind and soft way, Ia Anstud has now touched that nerve amongst a lot of people. And I'd encourage the viewers out there to go to that tweet, to give it the extra repost, add to the three and a half thousand comments uh, that are there. And that's going to send a real message to Greenpeace that the world has woken up to their cynical tactics. And if they want to remain relevant as an organization that supports to support a better planet, they need to change their tune. Well said. Well said. Um, and extra extraordinary uh, tweets there. Uh, even John Quakes would be um, uh, would, would be <laughs> jealous of that, I suspect. Hey, well, look, again, I'm just conscious of the, of the time and your country and you've got places to be. Um, here's a question for you. It's a question of the week. Um, so UEC this week um, let us know that they've made a couple of acquisitions. What do you think this means for the sector. Yeah, so look, we'll put the links in the show notes rather than spending time uh, talking about them. But in short, they've bought a portfolio of Canadian exploration licenses from Rio Tinto. And uh, UEC have been voracious. They said that they would be an acquirer going into the next cycle, and they've certainly delivered on that. 
and they've done so with the widespread support of their investors. So if there's an example of a company that's effective at flagging its intention, building up support for that strategy amongst its investors and then executing, I think we've got to hand it to UEC for what they've been able to achieve. So again, it's an example of further intelligent consolidation and starting to create the contrast with uh, some of the other activity that we're seeing in the sector in terms of promoters on different stock exchanges smelling the money associated with uh, the next significant bull run in uranium and starting to deliver projects that might be a little bit harder for investors to pit quality on. So well done to UEC for um, for executing yet another quality acquisition. They've helped to, uh, I think, take some of the stray assets held by an unloving parent in the form of Rio and put them into a portfolio where they'll be given appropriate and due care and attention. And if those assets do have potential, they're far more likely to realise that potential within UEC than within Rio Tinto, who are effectively looking at the door for this sector. The, the other thing that's interesting, and if I might express a few of my more cynical thoughts, uh, you know that the market's about to turn when Rio completes its final exit out of the sector. Uh, they seem to have real talent for, for falling the bottom uh, in the wrong way. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, but if you, if you don't mind, I just, I just want to look at this because I think, I, I think we have seen and will continue to see m a activity um in this space certainly as um you know you see things like in the early indicators like obviously spot price move you know contracts get signed people um the the, the supply def, def demand um deficit grow um and this massive infrastructure that's being built out um can, you know, continues to be be funded and you know politicians lean into the conversation and narrative but I think there will also be some more <laughs> some stranger decisions made as well, where people are either trying to take advantage of the this kind of positive market. So we've seen, I've, we've seen certainly recently, um, you know, spin outs, um, you know, where people have got a uranium asset which is non-core spun out and, and into other entities. Um, those seem to mix bag there in terms of how that's been received by the marketplace and that may be a factor of the the asset may be a factor of the new entity um or old entity that's kind of picked up the asset so i think there's you got to be quite careful about not all i don't i was big subscriber of not all things uranium will succeed or not all things uranium are destined to succeed because i think that the drivers um, need to align to your strategy. So, you know, some for some companies, it's like, Frankie, we need to make a quick buck here um, to fund our core assets. Or uh, on the, on the, on, in some cases, we've said, I'm not going to name names here, in some cases, you know, uh, highly valued assets actually sort of crumble into the ground because the, 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 the entity that the asset has ended up in doesn't necessarily have good management team, appropriate management team, experienced management team, or the ability to access capital to do what they need to do with that asset. So we've seen that recently. Um, and and um, I also also kind of feel there's more sort of generic um, investing thoughts here. I mean, you, you, I mean do, do join in when I've finished rambling, which, which is that the, the the there are lots of uranium assets which were have not gone anywhere and they've not gone anywhere for a reason fundamentally the assets aren't strong enough and you need a significantly higher uh uranium price than there is today and is forecast anytime soon those things to have a chance of, of working so lots of stragglers which i think the strategy seems to be from in some of these companies we will get bought out we will get taken out we will be rolled into someone else's portfolio and be assigned some kind of multiple in terms of value. That's a kind of out of control strategy. I think, you know, it's certainly in terms of most of the investors that kind of subscribe to our platform, a bit more fundamentals driven. And I think there's an opportunity here to, you know, sort the wheat from the chaff and focus on the companies who are advancing projects with the full intention of actually getting the thing into production because the asset's got a chance of doing that. 
or because they've got a position of, as they've got a chance of positioning the company as a chance of doing that and being taken out by someone with a meaningful balance sheet who maybe is a producer or, or you know certainly can advance the production of that specific um, asset. The kind of the the hit it and hope strategy. I think we're going to see a lot more of. Um, so you as investors, we've got to kind of pick the. Do you want to, do you want the company to be in control? Of their destiny, or do you want the company to, you know, like you? Let's let's see. Some something will happen. It'll be fine. We're in uranium, um, which is a bit more of a kind of sentiment driven, momentum driven, and you you fall back into that whole category of I've got to time my entry and I've got to time my exit without necessarily in control of any of the variables around that. So I think that that's. I like to see what UEC has done here in terms of M&A. It's a big company, big balance sheet, and this portfolio potentially has a chance to be advanced because the money will be allocated. And I don't mind Forum Energy um, either. I think, you know, they've, they've got some good assets, just they have been cash constrained. Um, Rio exiting, well, you, you said it all. You said it all. That they, they, they know how to do it. So, it, I mean, I mean, I don't know if you want to comment. Obviously, probably best not to name any names, but are you, are you seeing lots of different strategies being employed by people in different positions and different you know cash positions um out there do you do you expect to see more m a more spin outs more jvs more everything in this uranium space coming in the next few months yeah i do expect to see more everything and the ones to watch most closely are the significant uh merger consolidations and from a spin out point of view interestingly the the one comment I'd add to yours, Matt, is it, we know that the sector is looking real when the spin-outs work the other way. So there's been a couple of companies recently that have spun out their non-uranium assets as a lever for getting further leverage towards their uranium assets. So they're spinning out the copper, uh, spinning out I don't know, other mineral potential within their portfolio to give them more of a focus on uranium. And that's the natural evolution of things. And I distinguish that, uh, i.e. an exploration company that's had a portfolio of different minerals to give itself the best chance of hitting timing. I distinguish that from uh, some of the more promoter-driven activity in the sector where uh, someone stuffs a uranium asset into an interesting-looking company and then uh, enacts what's a fairly well-worn path that doesn't always end well. Uh, for those more diversified junior explorers who are now doubling down on uranium by using the non-uranium assets to give them better leverage and potentially f sources of funding to continue their exploration, uh, I think that's both healthy for the sector, it's a good indicator of where those management teams are thinking about uranium, and also it, it's the balance that juniors need to play in order to stay alive and you know, good on them for being still at the wicket and having the capacity now to bring those assets into a more supportive uranium environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I could go through about ten examples of of, of companies um, that I, that I've seen perhaps be a little bit cute or try to be a little bit cute. I I less than honest, but you know, where you've kind of got failed silver company jumps back to. Um, a lithium or picks up a lithium asset because it, 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 it provides some hope uh, of survival for them. But I think the market, you know, this is the great thing, I think. You know, when the market's buoyant and exciting and no one can fail, um, people make some real dumb decisions, right? Because it's the market's going to drive everything. And I, we saw that in 2020. And, and this is what gives me faith. In the last 18 months or so, in tougher environments, I think people have been just that little bit more astute with how they allocate their capital and they're less prepared to put um, their, their money into projects which they've always known are not necessarily good in terms of the assets or management teams that are not necessarily capable um, or situations which may endanger the capital. And, and, and I wish people would do that more even in the buoyant times because it means there would be less kind of crap that gets financed um but i guess that's human nature it, maybe that's a too, too much to ask for but it's been quite nice actually you know it's giving me a little bit more faith in sort of the the br broader um populace and their ability to collectively end up at the right 
decision. And I hope a bit more of that happens, um, certainly as this rain market um, picks up and the prices continue to pick up. But yeah, I, I mean, maybe it's, it's, it's one for another show where we can sort of rip through each of those kind of 10 scenarios where, um, you know, companies are destroying value in their own particular um, way. It's some fantastic examples in the last three months, but look, we better, we better sort of bounce on, um, where we, we, uh, onto the, I guess the, the, the final one and, and some people's favorite, which is moons, shots and fizzers that we're going to talk about now. Or what are we going to talk about now? I should well, say. Uh, yeah, well, let's talk about the micro reactor Oplo, micro reactor developer, and Centris Energy have entered into an MOU by which Centris uh, plans to provide HALU, high assay, low enriched uranium, for Oplo's micro reactor developments. Now, let's just put it out there as a moonshotter and fizzer, and we can keep coming back to this over future episodes. The reason why it's important, certainly for Oplo, is uh, viewers of this show would know that enrichment around the world is incredibly tight, particularly Western enrichment, given that Russia still produces or still has more than 40% of the world's enrichment capacity. So Western enrichment is extremely tight. Now, HALU, which is high assay, low enriched uranium, that's enrichment beyond 5%, and in this case, it's sitting just below 20%. That's even tighter because the only current provider of commercially available HALU is, yeah, you guessed it, Russia. So that's left a number of the US technologies that had were advancing their small modular reactors or their micro reactors. Their strategy was based on, initially at least, obtaining that commercially available HALU from Russia. And then that solved the kind of chicken and egg problem where the HALU producers won't uh, gear up and scale up until they know that the SMRs are being commercialized. Now, when you had a player, namely Russia, producing commercially available amounts of HALU, you could solve that because you could get the HALU to allow the commercialization that would justify the investment by the enrichers in further HALU capacity. So this is important for Oclo. Uh, it gives them undoubtedly a competitive advantage and it comes hot on the heels of um, an announcement that an Alaskan Air Force base has selected the Oclo micro reactor um, as their preferred, uh, select, uh, preferred partner to deliver a micro reactor to replace diesel generated electricity at that remote Air Force base. Um, so anything that, even though that's not a military application per se, it's still a civil uh, service provider to a military base, uh, which obviously positions them very, very well for deploying um, further use cases for their micro reactors. So definitely one to watch. It'll be interesting to see how quickly it progresses. So Centris is uh, expanding their American centrifuge production facilities at Pickerton, Ohio, and they've got good support from the DOE. And now with this memorandum of understanding, it gives them, uh, I think, a pathway forward to try and break that chicken and egg dynamic that's seen other micro react, uh, other SMR players announce in recent times that they were changing their technology away from Halo because they saw it as too much of a short-term risk to their commercialization plans. And in the broad context, there's a lot of eyeballs watching SMRs to see if they start commercializing this decade as opposed to the 2030s. And even now within the nuclear industry, there's a widely held assumption that SMRs, oh, they're so far in the future. They're 2035. We might see a couple before then, but they're not going to make the slightest difference to uranium demand. Now, I hold a different view. That view is becoming stronger. The scenario where we see significant SMR demand for uranium in the 2020s, late 2020s, based on wide-scale commercialization via orders that take place in the late 2020s, that scenario is becoming increasingly probable to me. And these are some of the key factors that I watch uh, to as sort of backfilling assumptions for that particular scenario. And halo availability and 
a pathway to that halo being available for particular technologies by 2027, 2028 is an important uh, throttle that um, could either advance in the form of a moonshot or hold back in the form of a fizzer the availability to market of those particular small modular reactor technologies. Well, there we go. That's been quite the session today. A lot, a lot covered. In fact, and lots of good um, investing advice, not just coverage of the nuclear and uranium sector there today. So I um, appreciate your time and your thoughts, more importantly, Brandon. Uh, enjoy the rest of your trip, and I'll see you next week at the WNA. Great. Thanks, Matt.